Hey, what's going on, U.S. History people? This is Mr. Norris. And Mr. Lawrence. And we are here to talk to you today about separation of powers, division of government power. So let's get going. All right, so maybe one of the first people that I think we should take some time and talk about is a guy by the name of Baron D. Montesquieu. And you might remember him from our discussions earlier on at the beginning of the school year, but also from Global last year as well. So who was this guy? Baron de Montesquieu, he was a philosopher, and he's part of an intellectual movement that we studied called the Enlightenment. So what were some things that he believed in as a philosopher? He believed in three branches of government, and those three branches are the judicial branch, the legislative branch, and the executive branch. Take a moment and look at this, and you see the number three. A good way to remember this is Baron de Montesquieu is three different words, or even Montesquieu is three syllables syllables. So anytime you see his name, think three branches of government. And he also believed in separation of powers, which is making sure that one branch does not become too powerful. So why did Mr. Montesquieu advocate for this? Well, we know from our study of European history of the dominance of absolute monarchs and this fear that small groups of individuals held too much power. So he believed that a government should to try and avoid this concentration is to limit power within different groups or different individuals. Mr. Lawrence, we see this word a lot, advocate, and you see it on multiple choice questions. And I believe you can't answer a question if you don't know what the word advocate means. So can you, t can you tell us what it means? If you advocate for something or someone, that means you are pushing for it, or maybe you're trying to help out an individual to accomplish a goal, or you're trying to maybe accomplish a goal through government. So he was advocating or favoring or trying to accomplish three branches of government. That's true. All right, so we'll talk briefly about the three branches, and then we'll dig a little bit deeper. But we have the legislative branch, and their job is to create laws. And we see this today in Congress. Then we have the executive branch, where within our federal system, you see the president, whose job it is to oversee the executive branch, which enforces laws. And then finally, we have the judicial branch, which interprets laws, and these are your court systems. Now, if you take a look at this picture here, you notice that it says that the U.S. government with the three different branches, and this is coming, this is growing out of the United States. When we're talking about these three different branches, we're talking about on a federal or a national level. All right, so what are some examples that we see of checks and balances. How do these three branches kind of work together and how do they limit each other's power? Again, going back to this idea of limited government, something that our founders believe strongly in because of that fear of a strong central government or a strong central monarch. So the first is the executive branch. And how does the executive branch check our other two, our legislative and our judicial branch? And the first way is through legislation vetoes, where the president has the ability to veto a piece of legislation without his signature it doesn't become law. So that veto legislation can either die or it can go back to the Congress for to be overridden. Also, the president has the ability to nominate judges. So the judges overall run the judicial branch. So his or her nomination as judge helps to kind of outline or um, set up our judicial branch. So that's a very good point. So we can see here through veto legislation, if Congress is getting out of hand or is passing unfair laws, a way to stop that is by the president vetoing them. Then let's go to the legislative branch. How can they check the other two branches? Well, if the president does something illegal or wrong, they can impeach him, which does not mean that he's removed from office. Is that correct, Mr. Lawrence? That is correct. It simply means that, he, that charges are brought against him and that president may be removed, but it only means bringing charges against a president. And they can also override vetoes. What percentage of Congress is needed to override a veto? Uh, Mr. Norris, to override a veto, it's very difficult because it requires two-thirds of Congress. But, Mr. Norris, let me just go back really quick and ask you, has there ever been a president impeached before? Is that something that happens very often within our system? It happens very rarely, but there have been two presidents that have been impeached. We had Andrew Johnson, who was Lincoln's vice president, became president when he died. He was impeached, not removed from office. And then we also have Bill Clinton in 1998, who was impeached but not removed from office. President Nixon was not impeached. He resigned before he would be impeached. But we've only had two presidents in U.S. history who have been impeached. Also, the legislative branch can approve all nominations. So going back to what you were just talking about, Mr. Lawrence, when the president 
nominates a judge, it's not finalized until the legislative branch approves that nomination. All right, and our last branch of our tree of three branches is the judicial branch. And what does the court system do? Now, specifically for our course, we focus on the Supreme Court, but it's important to know that there are different courts throughout the country. There are lower federal courts. There are also state and local courts. But specifically looking at the Supreme Court, how they are able to check the executive and legislative branches is through judicial review. Mr. Norris, do you remember what famous Supreme Court case actually establishes judicial review? Yes, it is one of the most important court cases, certainly the earliest one that we talk about in U.S. history, and that is Marbury versus Madison from 1803. And who is that famous chief justice that is associated with that case? Is that John Marshall? It was John Marshall, yes, absolutely. Wow. All right. So, guys, just to know what judicial review is, it, it, it allows, and actually the Supreme Court gave itself this power, and it's just been a tradition we've continued from the very beginning of our country, is that constitutionality. So the Supreme Court, once the president acts, makes an executive order, or once the Congress and the president actually pass a law, the Supreme Court has the right to review that action and determine if it was constitutional or not. If it was ruled unconstitutional, the law can just die, or they, Congress can create a new law. If the president takes an illegal action, then the court will recommend the president stop doing what he's doing. So if the president doesn't do his or her job right and stop an unconstitutional law from being passed, the Supreme Court can step in as well. So there's lots of ways to prevent bad laws from becoming laws. All right, let's talk about federalism. And you are a government expert, Mr. Lawrence, so I will let you take this. All right, so the question is, what is federalism? Now, our system is based off this federalist model. And what this is, it's a division of power within the government. And even if you look down in our bottom corner, you see it says the USA, and you have your national government and your state government. Almost looks like a delicious dessert. Mr. Norris, what kind of dessert do you think that kind of looks like? Uh, it looks like a cake. Yes, cake. I love cake when I talk about government, and it's true, and sometimes referred to as a layer cake model. And what it is, it's between states and national government. Guys, what we have identified here is sometimes we refer to the national government also as our central government or the federal government. For most of the rest of this PowerPoint, we'll refer to it as the federal government. So looking at that, we have it divided into two examples. You have your New York State Legislature and you have Congress. You also have a governor of a state who's the chief executive and you have the president who's the chief executive of our federal system. You have Congress who passes laws. If Congress passes a law, it must be followed by all people within the United States. If the New York State Legislature passes a law, it must only be followed by New York State residents. So it's just important to recognize federalism is a division of power between the state and the federal government. By the way, what is your favorite kind of cake? I enjoy vanilla cake. I'm vanilla too. No frosting. It's just plain vanilla cake. See, I like vanilla frosting too. Vanilla frosting, okay. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about powers, and there are three different types of powers that not only do you need to know the definitions, but you need to be able to provide examples as well. So we're going to look at the first one, and it's called delegated powers, and these are powers that are delegated or given to the federal government, and these are specifically stated in the Constitution. So something that only the federal government can do is declare war. New York State cannot declare war on another state or another country. So the power to declare war is only a federal or a national government issue. Also, to fix a problem from the Articles of Confederation, the federal government is the only one that can coin money as well or create money. So Mr. Norris, if I was to open up my constitution, which I do every single night before I go to bed and start to read, too. would I see delegated powers in the constitution? Would I actually say what these powers are? Yes, you would. They are specifically stated in there. And since we're talking about Congress, these are going to be in Article 1 of the Constitution. All right, so then that brings our reserve powers. So there are other powers that the government has that are not specifically stated in the Constitution. That's what we call powers that are reserved to the states. So not specifically stated in the Constitution. So, for example, things like driver's licenses. The founders in the late 1700s did not have any clue that we we're going to have things like automobiles, airplanes. But then the question is, how do governments still deal with these changes in technology. And if it's not specifically stated in the Constitution, it falls to the states. That's why you see there are different age requirements for different states for things like driving. I know in Florida you can start driving at age 15. Here in New York you have to be 16. So it is a state issue. And finally, the last 
type of power that you should know is concurrent powers. And if we're looking at this Venn diagram here over here, you'll notice that concurrent powers are the ones that are in the middle. These are powers that are shared by both the state and federal governments. And a perfect example is taxation. So this morning, Mr. Norris, when I drove to school today and I stopped to buy my cup of coffee, which I always do, I had to pay a tax. And that was a sales tax. Is that a federal or is that a local tax? That is a local or a state tax. And it's in Buffalo, it's 8.75. And about half of that goes to our county and the other half goes to New York State. All right. So we do have to pay local taxes as well as federal tax as well. So an example is what, we, again, we call concurrent powers that are shared by both. All right, that's pretty much everything you need to know about checks and balances in the division of power in United States government. I hope that helped, and uh, thank you for watching. Have a good day, guys.